Good day, doctors. Today, we will tackle on the different disease entities of the head and neck. I am Dr. April German Seller from the Department of Pathology. This lecture will include non-neoplastic and neoplastic lesions of the oral cavity, upper airways, ears, neck, and salivary gland. Let's begin with the oral cavity. Dental caries are caused by focal demineralization of tooth structure by acidic products of bacterial sugar fermentation and fluoridation of drinking water. Gingivitis is the inflammation of the oral mucosa surrounding the teeth caused by accumulation of dental plaque and calculus. It may occur at any age but is most prevalent and severe in adolescence. Dental plaque is a sticky colorless biofilm that collects between on and on the surface of the teeth because of poor oral hygiene. It contains a mixture of bacteria, salivary proteins, and discommated epithelial cells. If not removed, plaque can become mineralized to form calculus or tartar. Gingivitis is characterized by erythema, edema, bleeding, changes in contour, and loss of soft tissue adaptation to the teeth. Periodontitis is an inflammatory process that affects the supporting structures of the teeth, alveolar bone, and cementum. Secondly, include destruction of the periodontal ligament, which attaches the teeth to the alveolar bone. This leads to loosening and eventual tooth loss. Of the 300 bacterial species within the oral cavity, adult periodontitis is associated primarily with the following bacteria. Next, we have abscess ulcers, which are common, often recurrent, and painful. The causes are not known, but these ulcers affect up to 40% of the population and are most frequent in the first two decades of life. They tend to be clustered within some families and may be associated with immunologic disorders, including celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and Bichet disease. These lesions appear as single or multiple shallow hyperemic mucosal ulcerations covered by thin exudate and rimmed by a narrow zone of erythema. Next is irritation fibroma, which is also called traumatic fibroma or focal fibrous hyperplasia. It is a submucosal nodular mass of fibrous connective tissue that occurs primarily on the buccal mucosa along the bite line or the gingiva. It is thought to be a reactive process induced by repetitive trauma. Treatment is complete surgical excision. Pyogenic granuloma is typically found on the gingiva of children, young adults, and pregnant women, thus termed as pregnancy tumor. This exophytic inflammatory lesion is red to purple in color and frequently also ulcerated. Histologically, pyogenic granuloma is highly vascularized proliferation of organizing granulation tissue. Pyogenic granulomas can regress, mature into dense fibrous masses, or develop into a peripheral ossifying fibroma. Complete excision is a definitive treatment for these lesions. Peripheral ossifying fibroma is a common gingival growth that is most likely reactive in nature rather than neoplastic. As mentioned earlier, some arise from long-standing pyogenic granuloma and others develop de novo from cells of the periodontal ligament. The peak incidence is in young females. Peripheral ossifying fibromas appear as red, ulcerated nodular lesions of the gingiva. Again, it is a reactive lesion composed of proliferation of bland fibroblasts with a collagenous trauma that may contain dystrophic calcification, as seen below. And since these lesions have recurrence rate of 15 to 20 percent, complete surgical excision down to the periosteum is required. Next, we have peripheral giant cell granuloma, which is an uncommon oral cavity lesion that's likely representing a reactive inflammatory process. Grossly, you will see a soft to firm mass in the gingiva, often displacing the adjacent teeth and may erode underlying bone. 
it is generally covered by intact gingival mucosa. Histologically, peripheral giant cell granulomas contains aggregates of these multinucleated giant cells separated by a fibroangiomatous trauma. Although not encapsulated, the lesions are usually well circumscribed and easily excised. They should be differentiated from the central giant cell tumors found within the jaws and from the histologically similar tumor, but frequently multiple brown tumors of your hyperparathyroidism. Next is oral herpes, which usually presents as gingivostomatitis in children, pharyngitis in adults, and chronic mucocutaneous infection in immunocompromised individuals. Most orofacial herpetic infections are caused by HSV-1, but HSV-2 are seen in these cases. Herpes vesicles range in size from a few millimeters to large brillae filled with clear serous fluid. They rapidly rupture to become painful, red-rimmed, with shallow ulcerations. Intracellular and intercellular edema and acanthalysis create clefts that may become macroscopic vesicles. There are individual epidermal cells at the vesicle margins or free within the fluid and may contain eosinophilic intranuclear viral inclusions. Or several cells may fuse to produce giant cells or multinucleate polycarions. These are demonstrated by a diagnostic Jank test based on macroscopic, microscopic examination of the vesicle fluid. Vesicles and shallow ulcers are usually cleared spontaneously within three to four weeks, but the virus treks along the regional nerves and eventually become dormant within the local ganglia. Candida albicans is a normal component of the oral flora in approximately 50% of the population. It is the most common fungal infection of the oral cavity, especially in immunocompromised individuals. Oral candidiasis can be pseudomembranous, erythematous, or hyperplastic. The pseudomembranous form, which is termed oral thrush, is characterized by a superficial, gray to white inflammatory membrane composed of matted organisms enmeshed in a fibrinopurulent exudate that can readily, readily be scraped off to reveal an underlying erythematous inflammatory base. Per iodic acid shift stain reveals non subtated fungal Oral lesions are often the first sign of underlying systemic conditions. Hairy leukoplakia is a type of leukoplakia caused by EBV, usually in immunocompromised patients. Hairy leukoplakia takes a form of white, confluent patches of fluffy or hairy hyperkeratotic thickenings, almost always situated on the lateral border of the tongue. Unlike the thrush, the lesion cannot be scraped off. The distinctive microscopic appearance consists of hyperkeratosis and acanthosis with balloon cells in the upper spinous layer, seen here. Approximately 3% of the world's population have leukoplakia. 5 to 25% of these lesions are pre-malignant. Thus, until proven otherwise by histologic evaluation, all leukoplakias must be considered precancerous. Leukoplakia may occur anywhere in the oral cavity. The favored locations are your buccal mucosa, floor of the mouth, ventral surface of the tongue, palate, and gingiva. They appear as solitary or multiple white patches or plaques, often with sharply demarcated borders. They may be slightly thickened or smooth, wrinkled or fissured, or may appear as raised, sometimes corrugated, verrucous plaques. On histologic examination, they present as a spectrum of epithelial changes, ranging from hyperkeratosis, overlying a thickened acanthotic but orderly mucosal epithelium, to lesions with markedly dysplastic changes, sometimes merging into carcinoma in situ. Related to leukoplakia, but much less common and much ominous, is erythroplakia, which is red velvety, possibly eroded area within the oral cavity that usually remains level with or may be slightly depressed 
relative to the surrounding mucosa. Virtually all erythroplakias exhibit severe dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, or minimally invasive carcinoma, subepithelial inflammatory reaction with vascular dilation that contributes to the reddish appearance of these lesions is often present. Approximately 95% of cancers of the head and neck are squamous cell carcinomas or SCCs. The pathogenesis of SCC is multifactorial. Infection with high-risk human papilloma virus or HPV is not the primary cause of SCC of the oropharynx. SCC is strongly associated with chronic tobacco smokers and alcoholic drinkers. In India and Asia, the chewing of betel quid and pan is a major regional predisposing influence. Actinic radiation due to sunlight and pipe smoking are also known predisposing influences for cancer of the lower lip. SCC may arise anywhere in the head and neck region that is lined by stratified squamous epithelium. For the classic HPV negative SCC, the favored locations are the ventral surface of the tongue, floor of the mouth, lower lip, soft palate, and gingiva. For the histology, HPV negative SCCs are usually keratinizing and leads to poor clinical outcome. Conversely, HPV associated SCCs are most often non keratinizing neoplasms arising in the reticulated epithelium of the tonsillar crypts within the lingual tonsils, base of the tongue, soft palate, and pharynx. It is usually seen in younger patients and confers a rel relatively better prognosis than HPV negative SCCs. As with other cancers, SEC development is driven by the accumulation of mutations and epigenetic changes that alter expression and function of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. In general, molecular alterations can be categorized as loss of heterozygosity, copy number alterations, hypermethylation, changes in RNA expression and somatic DNA mutations. So first, we have several genes previously proposed as playing critical roles in SCCs, such as your TP53, CDKN2A, and PIK3CA were shown to be mutated with frequency sufficient to suggest that they are drivers of cancer development. Of the three mentioned, TP53 was the most frequently mutated gene. Second, a number of novel and potentially targetable genetic alterations were identified, particularly NOTCH1 and its associated pathways, and the tumor suppressor FAT1, which is also a member of the cadherin family. For the morphology, early stage keratinizing SECs appear as raised, firm, pearly white plaques, or irregular roughened or verrucous areas of mucosal thickening. Either pattern may be superimposed on the background of apparent leukoplakia or erythroplakia. As these lesions enlarge, they typically create ulcerated and protruding masses with irregular and indurated or rolled borders. Histological appearance demonstrating numerous nests and islands of malignant keratinocytes with your keratin whorls that invade as underlying connective tissue trauma and skeletal muscle. Keratinizing SCCs begin as dysplastic lesions, which may or may not progress to full thickness dysplasia or carcinoma in situ before invading the underlying connective tissue. This difference in progression should be contrasted to your cervical cancer in wherein you have your full thickness dysplasia representing carcinoma in situ that typically develops before invasion. So again, here in the oral cavity, dysplastic lesions may or may not progress to full thickness dysplasia. 
Also, keratinizing SECs range from well differentiated to anaplastic and sometimes sarcomatoid tumors. However, the degree of histologic differentiation, as determined by the relative degree of keratinization, is not correlated with behavior. SEC tends to infiltrate locally before metastasizing. The roots of extension depend on the primary site. The cervical lymph nodes are the favored sites of local metastasis, and the most common sites of your distant metastasis are mediastinal lymph nodes, lungs, liver, and bones. The histology of HPV-associated SCC is characterized by the proliferation of nests and lobules of non-keratinizing basaloid cells growing within sheets of lymphocytes. Immunohistochemical detection of strong P16 protein expression can serve as a marker for HPV-associated SCCs. However, further testing using PCR or in situ hybridization for high-risk HPV E6 and E7 mRNA expression may be required in certain cases. Let's proceed to odontogenic cysts. The overwhelming majority of odontogenic cysts are derived from remnants of odontogenic epithelium present within the jaws. In contrast to the rest of the skeleton, epithelial line cysts are common in the jaws. These cysts are subclassified as either inflammatory or developmental. In the interest of time, we will only cover the most common ones. First is the dentigerous cyst. They originate around the crown of an unerupted tooth as a result of fluid accumulation between the developing tooth and the dental follicle. Radiographically, these are seen as unilocular lesions, most often associated with impacted third molar tooth or your wisdom tooth. Histologically, the cysts are lined by your stratified squamous epithelium, surrounded by moderate fibrous trauma with multifocal chronic infiltrates. In some areas, the epithelium is detached. An irregular area of cementum is visible in the stroma near the cyst and the epithelium shows a bacillar palisade similar to your odontogenic epithelium characterized by parakeratosis. Next is keratocystic odontogenic tumor, which was previously referred to as odontogenic keratocyst. It must be differentiated from other odontogenic cysts because it is aggressive as compared to other cysts. Keratocystic odontogenic tumors can be seen at any age, but are most common between 10 to 40 years of age. And it is usually in males and located within the posterior mandible. The lesions are well-defined unilocular or multilocular radiolucencies with lining consisting of a thin layer of your keratinized straight stratified squamous epithelium with a prominent basal, la basal cell layer and a corrugated epithelial surface. Treatment requires complete excision because again of a locally aggressive behavior. Recurrence rates for inadequately removed lesions can be as high as 60%. About 80% of lesions are solitary, but patients with multiple cysts should be evaluated for nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome or the Gorlin syndrome, which is, which is associated with mutations in the tumor suppressor gene PTCH or your patch on the long arm of chromosome 9. Periapical cyst is a sequelae of dental inflammatory disease and represents the most frequent encountered cyst of the jaws. They are also called radicular cyst, apical periodontal cyst, root end cyst, or dental cyst. Those observed within the maxilla and the mandible after tooth extraction are called residual cysts. The cysts develop as a result of long-standing inflammation of the tooth or pulpitis often secondary to advanced carious lesions or local trauma. Necrosis of the pulp tissue may occur and traverse the length of the root to exit to the apex into the surrounding alveolar bone. Radiographically, periapical cysts represent as 
a well-circumscribed radiolucency at the apex of the affected non-vital teeth. Histologically, the cysts are lined by stratified squamous epithelium or epithelial cells derived from the rest of malaises. Ulceration is common, and if present, it may exhibit metaplasia, calcification, or hyaline or eosinophilic material called Rushton bodies. In the interest of time, the only two most common and clinically significant tumors, which are odontoma and ameloblastoma, will be discussed. Odontoma is the most common odontogenic tumor. It is a mixed epithelial and mesenchymal tumor-like malformation we term as hamartoma, which is composed of dental, hard, and soft tissues. Odontomas are defined as odontogenic tumors featuring production of calcified parts of teeth. Two main subtypes of odontoma are recognized. So you have the complex odontoma, which is architecturally disorganized with a variety of calcified patterns, but not enough, enough coordinated to have production of enamel, dentin, or cementum to reach a point where an actual tooth can be identified. It is more frequent in molar areas of the anterior mandible in female patients. In contrast, the compound odontoma exhibits a high degree of differentiation than the complex odontoma, so that the individual lesion characteristically consists of a mass of small misshapen teeth known as denticles. They are usually occur in the posterior mandible. Again, these lesions probably represent hamartomas rather than true neoplasms and are cured by local excision. Multiple odontomas may occur as a component of Gardner syndrome or familial colorectal polyposis. Again, in complex odontoma, there is haphazard arrangement and a variety of calcified patterns, whereas in your compact odontoma, there is a level of organization so that individual lesion appears like a mis misshapen tooth. Next, we have ameloblastoma. Ameloblastoma is the most common of the epithelial odontogenic tumors, but it is still comparatively rare, comprising approximately 1% of the tumors and cysts arising in the jaws. Gross appearance of ameloblastoma shows an expansile, solid, and cystic mass in the posterior mandible and ramus. Microscopically, many subtypes or patterns have been described. We have follicular, plexiform, desmoplastic, acanthomatous, granular, and basaloid. The two predominant patterns are your follicular and plexiform. Ameloblastoma exhibiting the classic follicular appearance with central stellate reticulum and peripherally palisading columnar cells with um, the so-called reverse polarization, there is an attempt to mimic the dental organ epithelium. The outermost cells resemble those of the inner dental epithelium of the developing tooth follicle. The cells are tall columnar cells with polarization of the nuclei away from the basement membrane. In plexiform ameloblastoma, it demonstrates irregular masses and interdigitating cords of epithelial cells. The desmoplastic pattern is uncommon and is characterized by dense sclerotic stroma that compresses the islands of your ameloblastoma. Squamous metaplasia within the stellate reticulum gives rise to the acanthomatous subtype. Granular cell ameloblastoma have tumor cells with abundant, deeply granular cytoplasm. The basaloid type consists of islands of uniform basaloid cells. There is no central stellate reticulum in the islands. This tumor shows hypercellularity, nuclear crowding, and nuclear hyperchromatia. Ameloblastomas are classified as benign to borderline neoplasms, but behave in a locally aggressive manner with a tendency to recur.
Next, we have the upper airways and nasopharynx. Infectious rhinitis, also known as the common cold, is caused by one or more viruses. Major offenders are your adenoviruses, echoviruses, and rhinoviruses, all of which evoke a profuse catarrhal discharge. During the initial acute stages, the nasal mucosa is thickened, edematous, and red. The nasal cavities are narrowed and the turbinates are enlarged. Secondary bacterial infection enhances the inflammatory reaction and produces a mucopurulent or sometimes superative discharge. Allergic rhinitis or hay fever is initiated by hypersensitivity to one of the large group of allergens, most commonly plant pollens, fungi, animal allergens, and dust mites. As with asthma, allergic rhinitis is an IgE-mediated immune reaction with an early and late phase response characterized by mucosal edema, erythema, mucous secretion, accompanied by eosinophilic rich leukocytic infiltrate. Chronic rhinitis follows repeated episodes of infectious or allergic rhinitis with the eventual development of superimposed bacterial infection. A deviated nasal septum or nasal polyp that impaired drainage of your secretions contribute to the likelihood of, my, of microbial invasion. Superficial disclamation or ulceration of the mucosa epithelium is common. Infections may extend into the sinuses, and fungi may cause severe chronic sinusitis, such as in your mucor mycosis, especially in diabetic patients. Sinusitis can uncommonly present as a component of your Cartagena syndrome, which, is also, which also includes your bronchiectasis and situs inversus, wherein there is a defective ciliary action. Histologically, you can appreciate acute uh, on chronic inflammatory infiltrates in the edematous stroma. So recurrent attacks of urinitis may eventually lead to focal protrusions of the mucosa producing nasal polyps, which may reach up to um, four centimeters in length. Histologically, these polyps show edema to stroma lined by your hyperplastic epithelium. High power of view shows your stroma edema again with eosinophil rich inflammatory infiltrates. And as you can see here, there is a lining of your respiratory epithelial epithelium. Despite features indicating an allergic etiology, most people with nasal polyps are not atopic, and only 0.5% of atopic patients develop nasal polyps. Pharyngitis and tonsillitis frequently accompany viral upper respiratory infections. Rhinoviruses, echoviruses, and adenoviruses are the most common causes. Remaining cases are primarily due to various strains of influenza or respiratory syncytial viruses. For bacterial infection, beta-hemolytic streptococci are the most frequent pathogens, but Staphylococcus aureus or other bacteria may also be present. Erythema and edema of the nasopharyngeal mucosa with reactive enlargement of the nearby tonsils and lymph nodes are characteristic. Chronic follicular tonsillitis are well-defined nodules of reactive submucosal lymphoid tissue with distinct germinal center formation. Tumors in the nose, sinuses, and nasopharynx are infrequent, but include a wide spectrum of mesenchymal and epithelial neoplasms. Nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is a benign, highly vascular tumor that occurs almost exclusively in adolescent males. It is believed to arise within the fibrovascular stroma of the posterior lateral wall of the roof of the nasal cavity. Gross slit presents as a polypoid mass that leads severely on manipulation and biopsy. Microscopically, nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is composed of loose edematous stroma with stellate fibroblasts and numerous mast cells to a dense a cellular, highly collagenized tissue. The latter is particularly striking and diagnostic. 
the cellularity varies between tumors but is often homogeneous in a given tumor. The vessels range from capillary size to venous size. The larger vessels are located at the base of the lesion, whereas the smaller capillary-like vessels whose plump endothelial cells are particularly common at the growing edge of the tumor. Mutations of in CTN and B1, which includes for your beta-ketanin, are present in the majority of nasopharyngeal angiofibromas. This tumor can also develop sporadically or syndromically in association with your familial adenomatous polyposis or FAP. Surgical removal, often with preoperative embolization to decrease bleeding, is the treatment of choice because nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is often locally aggressive with intracranial extension. Recurrence rates can approach to 20% and 9% of cases can be fatal. Next is sinonasal or Schneiderian papilloma, which is a benign neoplasm arising from the respiratory or Schneiderian mucosa lining the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses. These lesions occur in three forms. The most common is the inverted papilloma, second exophytic, and lastly oncocytic, formerly known as cylindrical cell papilloma. Sinonasal papillomas are most common in males between 30 to 60 years of age. The endophytic variant, or your inverted papilloma, may invaginate into the underlying stroma. The inverted and oncocytic papillomas occur almost exclusively on the lateral nasal wall and are unilateral. Most endophytic sinonasal papillomas have EGFR gene mutations. The remaining cases generally harbors your HPV DNA, often, often low-risk types 6 and 11. Although this is a benign neoplasm, it can display locally aggressive behavior within both the nose and the paranasal sinuses, including invasion into the orbit or cranial vault and has a high rate of recurrence if not adequately excised. Malignant transformation occurs in inverted and oncocytic subtypes. Next is esthetio or olfactory neuroblastomas, which arise from neuroectodermal olfactory cells within the mucosa, particularly in the superior aspect of the nasal cavity. The age distribution is bimodal. The peaks are at 15 years of age and 50 years of age. Patients typically present with nasal obstruction and or epistaxis. Histologically, olfactory neuroblastomas are small blue round cell neoplasms. Or olfactory neuroblastomas are typically composed of well-circumscribed nests and lobules of cells separated by your fibrovascular stroma. Pointed in the by the black arrows are the abundant fibrillary neural matrix. Again, your olfactory neuroblastoma is composed of small, monotonous cells with round nuclei in an eosinophilic fibrillary stroma. The cells appear to swirl around the vessels, and there are um, seen here is a diffuse and strong expression of synaptophysine by the tumor cells. Other neuro neuroendocrine markers, such as your NSP, CD56, and chromogranin are likewise positive. Depending on tumor stage and grade, combinations of surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy yield five-year survival rates of 40 to 90%. Next, we have NUT midline carcinomas, which are uncommon tumors occurring in the nasopharynx, salivary gland, or other midline structures of the thorax or abdomen. It can occur at any age from infancy to late adulthood, but the true incidence of NUT midline carcinoma is not known 
as it is easily mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. Despite this, any timid line carcinoma is clinically distinctive due to its extremely aggressive behavior and resistance to conventional therapy. Most patients survive for less than a year following diagnosis. Any timid line carcinomas are uniformly associated with translocations that fuse genes encoding for your NUT acromatin regulator and your BRD4 acromatin reader. Histologically, there are primitive small to medium-sized cells with minimal indistinct to clear cytoplasm with variably prominent nucleoli. There is high mitotic rate with prominent tumor necrosis. Shown is a diffuse positivity for the NUT seen in IHC or in, in your immunohistochemistry study. Next is nasopharyngeal carcinoma. The three principal factors that influence development of nasopharyngeal carcinomas are heredity, age, and EBV infection. For example, these neoplasms are particularly common in some parts of Africa where they are the most frequent childhood cancer. In contrast, nasopharyngeal carcinomas are common in adults in southern China, but rare in children. In the United States, nasopharyngeal carcinomas are rare in all age groups. Beyond EBV infection, diets high in nitrosamines and environmental insults, including smoking and chemical fumes, have been linked to these tumors. In non-creatinizing form, most patients have antibodies against EBV early antigens or viral capsid antigens, and PCR can be used to detect EBV DNA in the serum. Histologically, keratinizing and non-keratinizing nasopharyngeal carcinomas resemble well-differentiated and poorly differentiated SCCs or your squamous cell carcinomas arising in other, other locations. The undifferentiated variant is composed of large epithelial cells, seen here, with oval or round vesicular nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and indistinct cell borders. So there are two patterns seen in your undifferentiated nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and sometimes these patterns are, in, are seen in combination. The first is referred to as the rigot type of growth, consisting of well-defined aggregates of your epithelial cells surrounded by fibrous tissue and lymphoid cells. In the second type or pattern, it is designated as your schminky type growth pattern, wherein the neoplastic cells grow diffusely and are closely intermingled with the inflammatory cells. This type is confused with large cell malignant lymphoma. Non-creatinizing differentiated subtype usually has interconnecting cords and trabeculae or with little or no creatinization. Growth pattern is similar to your urethelial carcinoma. Tumor cells have well-defined borders with variable in cellular bridges. Background stroma demonstrates variable lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. Next is the creatinizing subtype, which is indistinguishable from your keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma from the other body sites. So there is obvious creatinization, as you can see here. There are keratin pearls and at a um, higher magnification, you can see intercellular bridges. The neoplastic infiltrate of cyanonasal basaloid squamous cell carcinoma is dominated by the basaloid cells comprised of pleomorphic and hyperchromatic nuclei with increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio and increased mitotic activity. Now, this nuclei shows palisading at the periphery of the tumor of the neoplastic lobule without associated stromal reaction, retraction. Primary nasopharyngeal carcinomas are clinically occult until they present at advanced stages with nasal obstruction, epistaxis, 
and metastasis to the cervical lymph nodes in up to 70% of patients. Radiotherapy is the standard treatment and results in an overall 5-year survival of approximately 60%. This, however, varies with histology. The stage-dependent 5-year survival for non-creatinizing NPC ranges from 70 to 98%, but for the creatinizing form, it is only 20%. This difference has been attributed to the divergent therapeutic response such as that your undifferentiated carcinomas are the most radiosensitive and the creatinizing carcinomas are the least radiosensitive. Lastly is a clinical syndrome characterized by slow progressive ulceration and destruction of the nose and the paranasal cavities with frequent erosion of the soft tissues, bone, and cartilage. Lethal midline granuloma is due to NKT cell lymphoma. In the photomicrograph shown is an infiltration of comprising intermediate size atypical lymphoid cells. Usually these um, cells express the NKT cell markers CD56 and granzyme. Next we have laryngitis. Laryngitis may occur as the sole manifestation of allergic viral, bacterial, or chemical insult, but it is more commonly associated with generalized upper respiratory tract infection, heavy environmental toxin exposure, or your GERD or your gastroesophageal reflux due to irritating effects of your gastric contents. Reactive nodules, also called polyps, develop on the vocal cords most often in the heavy smoke in heavy smokers or those who impose strain on their vocal cords, so we term as your singer's nodules. Despite this, the risk of developing cancer in these lesions is almost non-existent. By convention, vocal cord nodules are bilateral and the, the polyps are unilateral. Laryngeal um, squamous papillomas are benign neoplasms usually located in the true vocal cords that form soft exophytic proliferations that rarely exceed one centimeter in diameter. The lesions are caused by HPV types 6 and 11 acquired via the maternal birth canal. They frequently recur but rarely transform to your squamous cell carcinoma. Laryngeal carcinoma is mostly related to tobacco smoke. Risk is proportional to exposure. Prior to malignant transformation, epithelial changes frequently regress after smoking cessation. About 95% of laryngeal carcinomas are typical squamous cell carcinomas. Most arise on the vocal cords. Grossly, it usually presents as large, ulcerated, fungating lesion involving the vocal cord and piriform sinus. Histologically, the degree of anaplasia is highly variable and can include tumor giant cells and bizarre mitotic figures. Acute and chronic otitis media occur most often in infants and children. The origin is typically viral infection that induces a serious exudate. Superimposed bacterial infection most frequently by Streptococcus pneumoniae, H. influenzae, or Moraxella cateralis can lead to superative inflammation. Chronic inf infection has the potential to perforate the eardrum, encroach on the ossicles or labyrinth, spread into the mastoid spaces, and even penetrate the cranial vault to produce temporal cerebritis or abscess. In individuals with diabetes, otitis media caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa is especially aggressive and can spread widely, resulting in destructive necrotizing otitis media. Cholesteatoma are non-neoplastic cystic lesions associated with chronic otitis media. The cysts are typically 1 to 4 centimeters in diameter, lined by stratified squamous epithelium or metaplastic mucosecreting epithelium and filled with amorphous material. We have your keratinous debris. 
Also, cholesterol spicules may be present. Autosclerosis refers to abnormal bone deposition in the middle ear in the rim of the oval window into which the foot plate of the stapes fits. Both ears are usually affected. At first, there is fibrous ankylosis of the foot plate. This often occurs in early decades of life. Over time, bony overgrowth anchors the foot plate into the oval window. Autosclerosis is familial in most cases with an autosomal dominant transmission and variable penetrance. Shown is a dense cement line and woven bone. This one shows a comparison between those with autosclerosis and those with normal patients. Epithelial and mesenchymal tumors of the external, middle, or internal ear are rare with the exception of the basal cell carcinomas or squamous cell carcinomas arising from the pinna. They tend to occur in elderly males and are associated with the sun exposure. In contrast, squamous cell carcinomas of the ear canal occur most often in middle-aged to elderly women and are not associated with sun exposure. Squamous cell carcinomas of the ear resemble their counterparts at the other location or other sides of your skin, beginning as papules that extend and eventually erode and invade. Basal cell carcinomas are, are seen as reddish tan to pink pearly papules or nodules with or without ulcerations, often with telangiectasia. Micrograph of basal cell carcinoma shows as a characteristic histomorphologic feature such as your peripheral palisading, the myxoid stroma, and artifactual clefting. Despite local invasion, basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas involving the pina rarely spread. The vast majority of brachial cysts are thought to arise from remnants of the second brachial arch and are most commonly observed in young adults between 20 to 40 years of age. These benign lesions usually appear on the upper lateral aspect of the neck along the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The slowly enlarging cysts are well circumscribed which is um, two to five centimeters in diameter. Then the fibrous cyst walls typically contain the lymphoid tissue with prominent germinal centers. And the cyst contents may be clear, watery, or mucinous, and may contain discomated cells and granular cellular debris. This, this cyst do not undergo malignant transformation. Thyroid analogy begins in the region of the foramen cecum at the base of the tongue. As the gland develops, it descends to its definitive midline location in the, in the anterior neck. Remnants of this developmental process may persist, resulting in cysts that are lined by stratified squamous epithelium, well located near the base of the tongue, or to the stratified columnar epithelium in lower locations. The fibrous cyst wall often includes lymphoid aggregates or thyroid remnants. Malignant transformation of the lining epithelium is exceedingly, exceedingly rare. Paragangliomas arise from the neuroendocrine cells associated with the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and occur at many sites. Paravertebral have um, paraganglia have sympathetic connections and stain positively for chromaffin, which detects cells producing catecholamines. Paraganglia related to the great vessels of the head and neck or the so-called aortico-pulmonary chain, which includes the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies, are enervated by the parasympathetic nervous system and only rarely produce the catecholamines. Adrenal medulla pheochromocytomas are the most common paraganglioma. Approximately 70% of extra adrenal paraganglioma occur in the head and neck. Although the pathogenesis is not fully understood, 
loss of function mutations in the genes encoding for your succinate dehydrogenase or your SDH occur frequently in both hereditary and spontaneous paraganglioma. Interestingly, the incidence of these tumors is greater in people living at high altitudes. The carotid body tumor is a typical parasympathetic paraganglioma. The tumor tissue is red pink to brown and microscopic features are characteristic of paragangliomas elsewhere. Nests or cell ballen of round to oval chief cells with abundant clear or granular eosinophilic cytoplasm and uniform round to ovoid, sometimes vesicular nuclei, are surrounded by delicate vascular spaces or septae. The chief cells, which are neuroectodermal in origin, stain strongly for the New endocrine markers, including the, your chromogranin, synaptophysin, SNE, CD56, and CD57. The supporting network of spindle-shaped stromal cells, collectively called sust sustentacular cells, are positive for S100 protein. Serostomia is defined as dry mouth resulting from a decrease in the production of saliva. Its incidence has been reported to be as high as 20% in individuals or older than 70 years of age in some populations. Serostomia is characteristic of the autoimmune disorder Sjogren disease or Sjogren syndrome in which it is usually accompanied by dry eyes or your keratoconjunctivitis zika. It is also a side effect of the following drugs. Sialadenitis may be induced by trauma, viral or bacterial infection, or autoimmune disease. The most prevalent form of sialadenitis is the mucosil. Mucosils are most often found on the lower lip as a result of trauma. It occurs at any age and presents as fluctuant swellings with a blue translucent hue. This common salivary gland lesion results from either blockage or rupture of a salivary gland duct, with consequent leakage of saliva into the surrounding connective tissue stroma. Histologically, the mucosils are pseudocysts, pseudocysts meaning there is no true lining epithelium. The cyst wall is actually lined by inflammatory granulation, granulation tissue or fibrous connective tissue filled with mucine and inflammatory cells. Complete excision of the cyst and accompanying min minor salivary gland lobule is required as incomplete excision may lead to recurrence. Ranula is a term reserved for cysts that arise when the duct of the sublingual gland has been damaged. It has the same histology as your mucosil. The most common viral cause of sialadenitis is mumps, which affects the major salivary glands, particularly the parotids, and frequently involves other glandular organs such as your pancreas and testes. Obstruction of the salivary gland talks from lithiasis or inspissated secretions predisposes to stasis and infection. An acute parotitis is shown here with the neutrophils infiltrating the parotid gland and formation of an abscess around a duct. Elderly individuals are more prone to develop this problem. Staphylococcus aureus is the most common infectious agent isolated in these cases. Bilateral inflammation of the salivary glands can also occur acutely with mumps virus infection, but the inflammatory infiltrates are mainly composed of macrophages and lymphocytes, and sialidinitis is often patchy and resolves with minimal scarring. Despite their relatively simple morphology, the salivary glands give rise to more than 30 histologically distinct tumors. About 65 to 80% arise within the parotid, 10% in the submandibular gland, and the remainder in the minor salivary glands. The majority of parotid tumors are benign, but 40% of submandibular, 
50% of minor salivary, and 70 to 90% of sublingual tumors are malignant. Thus, in general terms, the malignant potential of salivary gland tumors is inversely proportional to the gland size. The smaller the size of the gland, the higher incidence of carcinomas. Pleomorphic adenomas are the most common salivary gland neoplasms. They represent about 60% of tumors in the parotid, which are less common in the submandibular glands and are relatively rare in the minor salivary glands. Pleomorphic adenomas are benign tumors that consist of a mixture of ductal, myoepithelial, and mesenchymal cells, which explains why they are also termed as benign mixed tumors. Little is known about the origin of pleomorphic adenomas, but radiation exposure increases the risk. Many cases are associated with chromosomal rearrangements that, in, that induce overexpression of PLAG1, also mutation of HAGMA2 genes are associated with many cases that lack the PLAG1 overexpression. Pleomorphic adenomas present as painless, slow-growing, mobile, discrete masses within the parotid or your submandibular areas. Most pleomorphic adenomas present as rounded, well-demarcated masses that rarely exceed 6, six cm in greatest dimension. The cut surface of such tumors is gray-white with mixoid and blue translucent areas of chondroid stroma. At low magnification, it is a heterogeneous neoplasm with a mixed proliferation of epithelial elements resembling ductal cells or myoepithelial cells arranged in ducts and acini and dispersed within the mesenchyme-like background of loose mixoid tissue. There may also be islands of chondroid or hyaline stroma as seen in this photomicrograph. If not removed, about 10% have malignant transformation after 15 years. Cancers are usually adenocarcinomas or undifferentiated carcinomas. The rate of recurrence following parotidectomy is about 4%. Next is warthin tumors. These tumors are much more common in males with high prevalence seen in smokers. The Warthin tumor is the second most common salivary gland neoplasm. It is unique in the sense that it arises almost exclusively in the parotid gland. Most Warthin tumors are unifocal, but 10% are multifocal and 10% are bilateral. Warthin tumors are round to oval encaps um, encapsulated mass, two to five centimeters in diameter, and readily palpable within the superficial parotid gland. Transaction reveals a pale gray surface completed by a narrow cystic or cleft spaces, filled with mucinous or serous secretions and frequently narrowed by polypoid projections of lympho lymphoepithelial elements. So in low power view, you can see here, germinal centers are prominent. The lining is composed of a double layer, so it's a bilayer of oncocytic cells. The innermost layer is columnar, while cuboidal cells occupy the outer layer. Oncocytic cells refers to large cells containing numerous mitochondria that imparts a granular eosinophilic appearance of the cytoplasm and have a large nuclei with prominent nucleoli. Next is the mucoepidermoid carcinoma, which is the most co um, common primary malignant tumor of the salivary gland, representing about 15% of all salivary gland tumors. Most occur in the parotids, but mucoepidermoid Carcinomas account for a large fraction of salivary gland neoplasms in other glands such as your minor salivary gland. More than half of the cases are associated with a balanced chromosomal translocation that creates a fusion gene composed of portions of your CRTC1 and mammal 2 genes. 
cut sections of the mucoepidermal carcinoma mostly is um, solid cut surface with occasional mucine containing cystic areas. Although they appear circumscribed, well-defined capsules are not present and the tumors are often infiltrative at the margins. Histology demonstrates cords, sheets, or cystic configurations of squamous, mucus, or intermediate cells. There's a varying proportions of your mucocytes, intermediate cells, and epidermoid cells, or your squamous cells. Mucous cells may have intra or inter extracellular mucine. Intermediate cells appear as small basal cells with scanty basophilic cytoplasm to larger and more oval cells with more abundant paleosinophilic cytoplasm that appears to merge into epidermoid or mucous cells. That's why they are termed as intermediate cells. Lastly, you have your epidermoid cells, which appear as bland, cohesive, flat sheets with um, squamoid or dense cytoplasm and well-defined cellular borders. Accordingly, mucoepidermoid carcinomas are class subclassified as low, intermediate, or high-grade. Well-differentiated mucinous cells predominate in these low-grade lesions and the high-grade varieties are more solid and have more infiltrative pattern of growth. Again, in high-grade tumors, squamous and intermediate cells predominate over the mucine-producing cells. The two less common neoplasms that merit brief description are the adenoid cystic carcinoma and axinic cell carcinoma. Adenoid cystic carcinomas are relatively uncommon tumors, which occur more in the minor salivary glands. Although the pathogenesis is not identified, MYB and FIB gene arrangements are present in a subset of adenoid cystic carcinomas. So grossly, the adenoid cystic carcinomas are small, poorly encapsulated, infiltrative, gray pink lesions. The tumor is composed of small cells with dark compact nuclei and scant cytoplasm. They are organized in cribriform growth pattern that resembles the Swiss cheese. The spaces between the tumor cells are often, often filled with hyaline material thought to represent excess basement membrane. There are three typical growth patterns, including the cribriform, tubular, and solid. In this photomicrograph, you have perineural invasion where there is um, circumferential growth in your around the nerve. Lastly, we have axinic cell carcinomas, which represent only 2 to 3% of the salivary gland tumors and are generally small and well circumscribed. Most develop in the parotid glands with the remainder remainder arising in the submandibular glands. The minor salivary glands, which normally have a scant, only a scant number of serous axinic cells, are rarely, rarely involved. Like warthin tumors, axinic cell carcinomas can be bilateral or multicentric. Histologically, axinic cell carcinomas are composed of cells that resemble the normal serous acinar cells of the salivary glands with small, round nuclei and variable morphology. They have abundant cytoplasm filled with basophilic zymogen granules, recapitulating the normal serous acinar digestive enzymes. But these cells can also be clear or vacuolated. And that ends my lecture on the pathology of the head and neck. These are my references. Thank you.